Good morning and welcome to Prime Time at the Library. Uh, I'm Robin Reilersdam, I'm the University Provost and I want to welcome you all to this, I believe it's the second Edgren Scholars presentation of the year. Um, the Friends of the BU Library collaborates with faculty development and other offices on campus to bring you programming that celebrates learning in and beyond the classroom of Bethel faculty, students, and staff, and we're really glad you've joined us this morning. The next edition of this is going to be on November 30, another Tuesday, when Nick Zemet, Assistant Professor of Social Work, is going to explore the who, what, and why of suicide and how to assess for suicide risks and threats and how to intervene for safety. So that sounds like a really important, um, important one to come to. Uh, today I'm delighted to welcome you to an Edgren Scholars presentation. The Edgren Scholars program supports faculty and student research teams as they collaborate on a research project. The project must be one that has the potential to make a significant contribution to the field of study and have a meaningful collaboration between the student and the faculty member. Uh, the program is named after our founder, John Alexis Edgren, and I love this quote. Uh, one of the key educational principles that he articulated way back in the 19th century was that the relationship between teachers and pupils shall not be that of commander and subject, but one of true friendship and helpfulness. And it's in this spirit that we established the Edgren Scholars Program in order to encourage and facilitate students and faculty working together. And I know that this is going to be a prime example of that going on uh, this morning. Today's Edgren Scholars are Dr. Ripley Smith and senior Kate Larson. And they're going to tell us about their communication studies project, No Place Like Home, understanding social connection amongst those experiencing homelessness. So welcome Dr. Smith and Kate. I want to thank all of you. We thank all of you for being here and uh, joining us for this conversation. Uh, we're, this was, I think we both would agree, uh, a really meaningful and moving uh, summer of uh, interacting with people with a lived experience of homelessness. And um, it, it was transform transformational for me. Uh, me as well, I have to say. <laughs> so let's introduce you to the project. All right, so uh, just to give you guys a little bit of a background on what homelessness looks like within the United States, um, how many people do you think experience homelessness on any given night in the United States? Does anyone have any numbers that they come to mind? Best guesses. No pressure if you're wrong. A couple hundred thousand. That's pretty good. That's not far off the mark. 580,000, according to you know January 2020 figures. Uh, on an average night in the U.S., and this is in a country with a GDP of over 21 trillion, you know, and a per capita income of over 63 thousand dollars. So that's startling. Yeah. And then, in relation to that, how many people in Minnesota do you think experience homelessness on any given night? Two thousand. Two thousand. Good guess. One more guess. Grace, what would you say? <laughs> what did you say? Nice, yes. It's close, 7,900 plus yeah. on any given night in Minnesota. Which is also striking, in 2019, Minnesota was one of the top five states to actually see a massive increase in the homeless population. Um, and then we also see COVID adding different factors within increase and decrease of homeless population as well. Mm -hmm. So how do we get invited or involved in this project? Uh, it's, it's a longer story than I'm able to tell tonight, but it involved uh, coming, getting, my getting to know a physician, he's a plastic surgeon, and his side passion is creating a tiny home community that would uh, serve people experiencing homelessness. And so it's a, he calls it a, a collaborative because it's a consortium of healthcare providers, social service agencies, um, advocacy groups like Freedom from the Streets and Street Voices of Change, and they all have come together. And he's got on his leadership team um, people with lived experience of homelessness that are part of the leadership team that have, are developing this project. Um, the good news is they've gone through the legislative process and they've received 
uh, some funding and some, you know, the, the legislative parameters are in place where they can begin uh, building their community and they have a prototype unit that sits in the parking lot of Elam Church in North Minneapolis. So if you ever wanted to go see it, you can uh, get a hold of Envision and tour the unit and get involved with that project. Um, what's unique about this project is it is designed and led by people with lived experience of homelessness and the residents will be uh, a primary part of the operation of this community. So it's a, it's a pretty significant change from the way a lot of these communities are formed. So our research questions, as uh, when we got involved, they, the reason that um, we were asked in, to be part of the project was because of some expertise that I have in social network analysis. And most of my work has been done in refugee communities, but there are a lot of transferable concepts that we anticipated. Um, and so the two of the, there were other research questions, but the two primary ones were what do the social network properties uh, what, or what properties will characterize the social networks of people with lived experience of homelessness? And then are there particular patterns of social connection that will correlate with housing instability? And because they are a collaborative of a number of different organizations, we were interested in a lot of different variables as we collected this data. Yeah, and so in terms of our procedure, we did a mixed method study, meaning that we collected both quantitative and qualitative data. Um, the interviews we conducted were semi-structured and they lasted about 60 to 90 minutes. We gathered um, information about individuals, social networks, safety and security, health, conflict, and substance use. In terms of um, the instruments, we used instruments that were pretty widely known within the field and had high reliability and validity uh, coefficients. And so, Here's an example of the community attachment instrument that we use. It's just a one question instrument that seeks to understand how people, individuals felt connected to their community on a whole, just selecting one of these diagrams that represented that. So the sample characteristics, I'm sorry, you were gonna yeah. discuss this yeah. sample. In terms of the characteristics, we did 62 interviews that were usable. We had 29 female participants and 33 male participants from ages 19 to 75. Um, out of our participants, 64.5% were people of color. And um, out of the whole population that we, or sample that we interviewed, 16.5% were indigenous. Something super striking that we noticed was, or found that, was that eight, the average length of homelessness that participants experienced was 8.2 years, which is longer than I was expecting by far. Um, and the average network size for individuals was 9.6 people that they identified. And that uh, homelessness range was from about a half a year, uh, some of them precipitated by COVID events, up to 40 years of experiencing homelessness. Uh, so it was a really significant wide range. So some of the demographics, uh, the education, you can see that the less than a high school degree is red, having a high school uh, diploma or GED equivalent, about 22%. Um, but there were uh, a few of our participants that had college degrees. One had a master's degree in finance, um, but found herself homeless, so or experiencing homelessness. Um, the employment pattern was uh, similarly diverse. Um, over 40% were unemployed, uh, about 18, almost 19 percent worked full time, and yet were still homeless, uh, experiencing homelessness. And so, some of them were, at, you know, kind of representative the uh, working poor. Um, one person had several part time jobs, but didn't have enough to to make rent. And then uh, others were part time or irregular employment. Yeah, something super interesting about our research that was kind of mentioned a little bit earlier was that it was community-based participatory research, meaning that involved in the entire process, we had team leaders who had experience of homelessness. So designing the uh, interview that we were asking people, we had ideation sessions with them, as well as um, as we started to gather more data, we would present the raw data to our team leaders and they were the ones extrapolating um, some of the findings that we were getting and just confirming the validity of the things that we were also starting to pick out. And some mm -hmm. of these are them here. So, yeah. 
this was a brand new experience for me, uh, having people who were not trained in research methods, did not have graduate degrees, but had a level of experience that offered uh, a meta level to the data. Because we would sit down and, and talk through or show examples of our data and listen to uh, some of the audio, which we're gonna give you guys a sampling of some of those clips. Um, and then to, to sit back and hear how they're interpreting what's happening and what's being said was fascinating. Um, it was just a completely different research experience than I've ever had before. So it was, it was really encouraging and, and interesting and more relational too, in the sense of um, part of what the, the team leaders offered was rapport that we did not have with our participants. And so that, I think, led to more open conversations or willingness for people to talk to us. Because for us to recruit participants, we use organizations that they are leaders in, uh, like Street Voices and Freedom from the Streets. And many of our contacts came through uh, people that um, were directed to us by their efforts. So we want to get you into a little bit of the analysis and how we went about it. Because it was a mixed method study, we had both qualitative data and quantitative data. And so when we finished the interviews, and we did 62 interviews, as Kate mentioned, that were an hour to an hour and a half long. And so we have a lot of data. And uh, I, I constantly have to you know, thank Kate as well as apologize because she did most of the transcription. And it was laborious uh, because we we tried to use Zoom that kind of captures a transcript, but we were um, yeah it wasn't good because they, we were all masked right we're in the middle of COVID we're all masked up the Zoom recordings were uh, hit and miss um, yeah it just there were complications with that so but after we transcribed the interviews we after uh, Kate transcribed the interviews. Um, then we began our process of uh, coding, and we coded separately. So she coded all of the interviews, and I coded the interviews, and then we would meet and talk through the themes that we were seeing emerge and look for intercoder reliability so we could settle on a set of constructs. And then we began uh, in this methodology something called axial coding, where you're starting to look for supra constructs that tie together smaller level, uh, themes that are emerging so you can begin to develop a model of what's happening here. Um, on the network side, we had captured a bunch of social relation data, and that data we had to code into um, using uh, an editor that allowed you to code in XML because we had to create every person's profile in XML uh, sheet, and then that's the data that we would feed into the social network analysis program uh, that would interpret and give us some of the sociograms. So you see here a, a representative uh, or example from, we use a program called Atlas TI that lets you visualize your coding. And so you've got some of the, the themes that we have and then uh, the white boxes are a theme and then we created a um, super construct of, a, of barriers that we began to see people articulate different kinds of barriers. So then we had sorts of barriers and then you attach the quotations that illustrate or lead you to that construct um, and you can begin to kind of build a story that leads you to these findings or these ideas and the themes. Yeah, and so just my experience as a researcher this summer was super interesting. I would say I was really struck by the way that research could be an opportunity for marginalized groups to uh, have a voice. I did not realize 10, 15 minutes from my house there's people with these circumstances and these stories. And I was just extremely struck by how vulnerable participants were in telling their story. Um, I also gained a lot of understanding of the importance of communication as a discipline. The complexity of it, working with Dr. Smith, was just a super amazing opportunity um, to see all the layers that kind of go into it, but then also the way that it applies and is super important um, to our world as a whole, communication has a lot of implica implications for real life. Um, and then just also understanding the depth of research. Now, before uh, researching, I could look at a study and see like 100 participants and not think much about it. But after interviewing 
62 people, it's like those are 100 people with stories, with lives that have gone into their understanding, and that's what makes it important. So, yeah, understanding that part of research is really, really valuable. So a quick shout out to Bethel and the Edgren uh, Scholarship Program because that made this possible. Uh, we also received some funding from a Community Health Improvement Partnership uh, outside of Bethel. So thanks to both of those organizations for making this possible for us to be able to focus on that. Yeah, and so we wanted to give you guys a little bit of a taste of what the interview was like in order for you to understand a little bit more about your own social network to understand the greater implications. So you can pull out your phone and use your notes app. You can also just think about this if you prefer not to get out your phone. But in terms of our interview, we would ask participants when thinking about their social network, um, who are some people in your life that are in your corner, they love you, they support you, you know that they're um, gonna be there for you and they give you a sense of you belonging. So you could probably come up with a number of names. Think of some specific people yeah. who are there for you in terms of emotional support like that. Try to come up with some names if you can see them in your head. The second area that we asked was, uh, who do you socialize with? Who do you spend time with, hang out with, catch a meal with, periodically spend time in recreational settings with, playing pickleball? Um, you know, who are those people? Come up with that list. Yeah, we'd also ask questions you don't have to, but you could probably think about practical support. So if you were looking to move a couch or just needed someone to give you a hand with something, financial support, if you were looking to borrow money from someone, or the last one was advice. Advice. So seeking counsel for people that you could turn to for making big decisions and looking for wisdom. So as you guys think about those five modes of support and the people in your own life that provide that support to you, Think of how many people you have as we dive into the findings here. We want you to have that picture in your head of who's in your life in that way. Yeah. So this is the model that we em eventually emerged as we were going through the qualitative data. Um, we heard a lot about uh, origin stories and how they ended up in the predicament of experiencing homelessness. And origin stories included everything from um, alcohol and drug uh, addiction, um, some encounter with uh, either actual criminal behavior or being accused of criminal behavior. Um, help me out, some other origin. Abuse uh, played a, long, a large role. There was a lot of times where relational issues. Family concerns. dysfunctions. Um, yeah. So a lot of different orange, origin stories began to emerge. And then uh, as, as we heard the stories, um, people began articulating barriers uh, that were in their way, and we'll go more into barriers here in a second. And then we began to see that not that there were barriers, but those were juxtaposed with pathways, um, pathways that people had either accessed or were available to access to improve their situation. And uh, with each one of those, there was a social architecture that began to emerge that um, said something about either how that occurred, the origin, the barriers that were in place, um, resources they could access uh, as avenues for pathways. And so we wanted to look for the social architectures and patterns in those that could tell us something about the origins, the barriers, the pathways. But over all of it, we began to see that there were mindsets that emerged. And that's one of the variables that we'll dive into here in a second. Uh, so it's definitely a working model, and I will admit now that we have not finished our data analysis. Uh, we have so much data, and uh, the summer ended. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so. Yeah, so looking at the mindsets that we identified, three of them mainly emerged. Um, one of them, homelessness as a way of life. There was participants, we said, who had been experiencing homelessness for 40 years. Um, and others with super long careers experiencing homelessness. And a lot of these people, um, the way they talked about it, it was, this is the reality, this is how I live. Um, while a lot of them identified craving more outside of it, they really did not identify a lot of um, pathways and this really seemed to be their way of life. Other people um, were very positive about their situation, seeking um, 
active goals, um, support in different ways. Some even identified, I'm not homeless, I'm just experiencing this right now. This is a season of my life. Um, another mindset was sort of just this feeling of hopelessness and uncertainty. Um, a lot of people seems very lost in their situation, not knowing where to turn um, or what a pathway out of homelessness would look like. So I want to give you a, a glimpse into some of the qualitative things that we were finding. And then uh, quickly, we want to dive into the social network and then play you some clips that you can see uh, what somebody's relational resources look like and what their um, kind of clips that kind of illustrate the mindsets that that we were identifying. And um, so I mentioned the barriers. So this is a, a map of some of the, the barrier concepts that we were looking at. So one barrier was homelessness as a stigma. And so this person says, homeless people, we don't get the respect, you know? I'm not talking about people throwing out a red carpet for us, just acknowledge us, right? So we heard uh, words like that, where they were talking about just had the stigma of homelessness being a barrier. Um, another barrier was injustice. So this person, he says, the system here has got me in a situation here, not just me, me and other folks. And so that's my roadblock. My biggest disability is the state of Minnesota. Well, first, the roadblock is you get a fair shot in justice. And you know, in my trial, so I mean, you know, I got locked up and, and then I get released and with all the restrictions and labels and lies and, and, he, and he goes on to articulate that. So that becomes uh, a barrier. Um, the injustice or the justice system. Yeah, some of other things that we found, we got some pathways on here, ways that people were seeking um, ways out of their experience of homelessness. Some identified were um, spiritual strength, the community they found, or lack thereof. Community was an also a big variable we're looking at. That is what we were tasked with examining. So we had people that it was really significant the number of people that chose to self-isolate. That was a super common theme. Um, and then you see that also tie in with the barrier of peers that drag you down. So those two were often linked in a lot of ways. Um, but safety and security, we have some a quote here of someone talking about their experience of seeking safety and security. Um, they say, having a good neighbor, you live in a place you want to know your neighbors and basically knowing your neighbors has a lot to do with it because if you don't know who you're living next door to, it's not good. So that was just um, in hopes of what they would look for within a community, wanting to find people that they felt safe around. Yeah. And shout out to Kate here. This is one of the, the, the kind of enjoyable aspects of this project for me was working alongside a sharp young mind and just the being able to toss ideas back and forth. And so one of the meetings when we got together to look at our intercoder reliability, um, she had a code that I did not have um, because one of the pathways ended up being altered centrism as the person stopped focusing on themselves and she called it belonging through giving back. And even though these people were in a situation and this particular person was in a situation where they were experiencing homelessness, they had nothing uh, really in terms of resources, but they found ways to give back. And that was striking, that, but that was part of their pathway to moving forward and getting out of that situation. So we ended up uh, in terms of the barriers and the pathways, we could kind of juxtapose what are the various barriers that people encountered, whether it was uh, a criminal history or um, their health or homeless stigma, um, the peers that drag you down, that came uh, up a lot that, you know, kind of the company that we keep was the theme and how that can drag you back into certain kind of behaviors. And so then juxtaposing that with the pathways um, of either alter centrism or being empowered, finding community, um, human assistance, um, certain people in certain organizations, uh, whether they're social service or shelters or churches, we would hear their names over and over, right? These people that were reaching out to this community, people experiencing homelessness. And uh, uh, these people are known entities. And so sometimes it was because of direct human assistance. Um, there's one story, this guy, I think he had been in prison and he came up and he was camping uh, in one of the encampments 
And there was a, a young woman there that would come with a group of people that came to provide laundry service. Uh, they were just volunteers from the community that provided laundry for people in some of the encampments. And um, this gentleman was so appreciative of that and struck up a relationship. And uh, this, in, in conversation, this young woman found out that um, all he really needed was a vehicle. And then he could get back to some you know, family or connections and resources. And so she, with some friends, raised, she crowdfunded some money so that he could buy a vehicle. This is a person who just happenstance encounter. We helped with laundry with one of the encampments. And it was, it was that human assistance. It was that piece of his pathway that he needed to kind of move on. Um, that was amazing to me. Uh, and what it says is all of us can be a resource in that way, right? I mean, we can make, we can be that little piece in that person's journey coming alongside them. Yeah, yeah so here we have um, the so sociogram of one of our participants who exemplifies the mindset of homelessness as a way of life. Um, this participant is actually this node right here. And essentially the colors also signify uh, depth of connection. This here is his fiance. Um, outside of his fiance, these people are all people he's no longer connected with. This was his one person in his life. So if you think back to your so so social network that you were able to picture, um, the average number of people that um, our data was able to, so in participants in our sample were able to identify was less than 10. The average is about between 40 and 60. So, and this participant had six people that he identified. Um, the density of his network was 0.286 and his attachment to his community, what he felt, the way he felt community, attached to his community was very low out of two. But something super striking was that he identified having four out of five on support satisfaction. He was almost completely satisfied with the support, which kind of exemplifies the mindset of this is the way of life and this is this this is the support I have and I'm comfortable with that. Um, this algorithm um, is it uses a it's uh, it's like these are atomic particles and they're both repelling and attracting each other. And what attracts particles, the, the nodes together, is connection. So which is why these, some of these were family members back where he grew up. Um, he left his home when he was 13. Um, family kind of fell apart and he was put into a foster system and then he just hit the streets when he was 13. And basically never went back to a home or stable situation. Um, and so the, what you can't see is each one of these connections has a weighting to it, and it's based upon the number of resources that are available through that link, as well as the frequency of interaction. And uh, even his fiance was only uh, a one or maybe two resource connection. Right? This person had a very independent loner mentality and mindset. And we want to play you a little bit of the audio, and I've got uh, this participant and then one other that I... I Put in this audio, but I want you, we want you to hear their voices on this and um, part of their story. When we were in different different city and state, I witnessed uh, uh, outreach people. Uh, they purpose was going in the, in the woods and you know all these you know other little crevices of the city and find people and help them out of there with how. Yeah. And what they found out was that these people that have been out there. For, for an extremely long period of time, you know, didn't know how to respond to living a normal life. You know, so some people don't know how to make that transition to live into a place. Even though it may be y'all's purpose to help people do that, some people are just going to be resistant to that because they're used to what they used to. Right. She's been homeless and she's going to be homeless. And if she got, if she had a place to go, she would screw it up somehow, maybe not knowingly, mm -hmm. but that's just her personality. Like I said, I've been homeless off and on since I was about 19. Sometimes it was cool, you know, I've traveled across the country. 
I've been down and out where I had to go a month or two without being able to probably take a bath or get cleaned up and scrounging, you know, not knowing where the next meal is coming from, not knowing where anything's coming from. I've been down and out to that point. I'm down and out right now. Just because you're homeless doesn't mean you have to look like you're homeless. Doesn't mean you have to act like you're homeless. You don't have to wear the same clothes for a year and, and never get clean. I've, I've, I've been to that point, but I never stayed at that point for very long because it's not who I am. It's, it, you can see some of the different mindsets that began to emerge in their stories, um, whether it was a temporary existence, uh, something that they were in and out of, um, even though that second person had been homeless since, you know, off and on since they were 19, and they were quite a bit older than that now. Um, and the, the first participant that you heard um, had been homeless for 40 years. Um, so you can kind of hear the, the mindsets that we were beginning to hear emerge. So this was a second participant, and um, this participant was a female who also had 27 years of homelessness. Um, similar, you see a similar characteristics in her social network of it's very sparse. She's got nine authors, uh, so a few more than, than uh, number 61, but um, not well connected. And I'm going to play you a clip from her too, so I won't steal her thunder. But um, she also sees her support satisfaction as pretty good. Um, uh, not, uh, you know, it's like there's a different um, metric for what is supportive um, in her life after that many years of homelessness. But sees herself like the first uh, participant you heard as very detached from her community, uh, not really feeling connected. Outset. Oh. I don't know a whole lot of people. Not just myself and my fiance. Also, oh. right. Yeah. I hang out with anybody. I'm kind of lonely. Yeah. Okay. I have been all my life. So. Have you? Did you guys? Can you hear that? Just like um, I, I don't really know many people. I'm kind of a loner. I have been all my life. Um, so now, now you get a little taste of of why it was so hard for me to transcribe these interviews. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now that's a trust issue there. Um, yeah, I'm pretty independent myself. Okay. My dog goes wherever I go. Okay, so you know, travel. <laughs> sure, um, I don't travel, so, I mean, for real, you know. Um, I'm pretty much a homebody, but, you know. Yeah. Um, if the dog, if I go outside, I take the dog off. Sure. Just to sure. Right. I don't know. I don't really call on anybody else. Sure. Okay. So that last thing she says, I don't really rely on anybody else. I don't depend on anybody else. And what we tend to see in these networks are a lot of isolates, right? They've got a lot of people that just aren't connected. And who these people are sometimes was striking to us because they can be what... In, in social network analysis, you have strong ties, and a strong tie would be a family member that you see all the time, that you rely on, your roommates that you're really connected with. You might have classes with them, maybe you work with them. They're in multiple life sectors. You have a Bible study with them, you go to church with them. And so we've got multiple life sector people who offer multiple kinds of support through those ties. That's a strong tie. And you can go for them to them for advice and emotional support and, and just to socialize and um, a lot of the people that showed up in these networks are what we would call weak ties. These are strangers, essentially, that you know, they interact with infrequently, maybe provide one type of support infrequently to them. And yet, when we ask them, who do you rely on, that's who showed up in the network, are people like that, um, that are weak ties uh, that most of us would not include when we have a, a rich social capital rich resource life um, with strong ties, those weak ties usually aren't going to make the list. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, 
and this participant here is someone who we identified as having a positive mindset. Uh, they were extremely driven in the ways that they were seeking support, they were seeking avenues. Um, and as you can see, they, uh, while they had pretty low or small social network, with they identified a higher community attachment, but they also had really low uh, satisfaction with their support. This wasn't what, what they wanted to have, this isn't where they wanted to be, the kind of positive mindset of there's more than this. Apologies, in this clip there is uh, one unethical word. <laughs> uh, my current situation, I've been homeless since I was about 13, 14, uh, dealing with manic depression and things like that. Uh, I met my fiance about a year and a half, two years ago. She's been my motivating factor. Pretty much, I guess, something I've been looking for all my life because to me, success is a piece of shit if you don't have nothing to share it with. Mm -hmm. So I want to have the right person to share it with first. And not just in regards to the financial success, but it's just on and on, general total reentry on a bigger part, emotional, emotional success, because a lot of this homelessness is based off of manic depression. I'm gonna say 99.9% .9 of all homeless people are depressed. Hmm. You're gonna have a little criminality in there, you're gonna have a little psychosis in here. But for the root part, we're all depressed. Hmm. And we, gotta, we, gotta, we gotta face the depression in order to begin our reentry. Just because you begin your reentry doesn't mean you to be successful. Uh, you know, sometimes I wonder uh, where am I at in the world or where am I at in my country? I'm just blessed that I didn't snap off and I have a self discipline and I have snapped off yet. And I have uh, count my blessings just because I'm going forward. At least. So you can see the different mindset there, uh, just in the not perceiving his situation as a permanent situation and that he's taking steps to move forward. Uh, and you, you see it in some of the connectedness of his network too. He still has pretty low density in the network. Uh, in a well-connected, resourced network, your density is probably gonna be up toward 0 0.45, 0 0.5, uh, even 0.6. Um, and a lot of our participants were in 0.2 area. Um, so it's still a radial sparse network, but he recognizes that, you know, as Kate said. So, um, real quick, one last example. Why don't you talk about yeah. 37? This last participant is someone who seemed extremely um, uncertain about avenues and were experience, was experiencing a lot of hopelessness. Something super striking about her network was that the people that she identified, one of which was the repairman at the auto dealership that fixed her car, was someone that she named as a source of support. Um, but as you can see, a lot of them are just single disconnected altars um, versus what you'd see is normally those denser, small clusters of um, connections within a network. But this participant, yeah, completely unable to. And some of the networks, we can kind of identify different sectors of uh, where family are, where people they met in a shelter and they'd be connected. And Hers was really difficult. I mean, she really didn't have any clustering going on in her network. Um, she really was lost amidst this storm and had no strong ties. She was from out of state, came here to go to school, uh, lost housing, and had been really flailing since then, um, dropped out of school, but she was working. Um, and so she's uh, working and still not able to um, generate enough income to, to find housing. And uh, she had family in another state, but uh, what we heard a lot come through was shame or not wanting to bother family. And that was her situation. She had children and, and uh, siblings in another state, um, and, but she didn't want to bother them with, with her deal. So we wanna leave some time for questions. So what we're hoping to do uh, next, the. The really great thing is this is what I call meaningful research um, because we're working alongside an organization. Uh, we got a huge uh, grant from the state and we're identifying property right now. You can imagine there's some hurdles to identifying property. 
to put a uh, community like this next to other neighbors. There are a lot of neighbors that don't want a community like this next to them. Um, but that's, we're, we're working on that. Um, we have already conducted two workshops with advocacy groups um, to train them in the kinds of things that we're identifying in order to establish a stable community uh, because we're going to need the participation of those advocacy organizations to try to make this a, su a success. So we've already conducted two of those workshops and um, the part of the reason for collecting this data was to create a baseline of community uh, relational data because we want to measure the relational uh, resources once that community is started and do a longitudinal research project um, to see you know, how things are coming along. Are we improving the sense of community attachment? Are we improving the multiplexity of ties? Um, because as uh, the physician that invited us into the project likes to say, he thinks this is the secret sauce. Um, it's not just providing a roof for people. Um, it's going to be providing a community that they can attach with. We know that there's a lot of barriers and mindsets that are going to be hurdles to that. And so we're hopeful that um, we can kind of walk along with them and, and be a part of that journey. So, And we hope to submit a uh, publication so Kate can get her first uh, scholarly journal pub. So that's, that's in the works. This is where you ask questions. So oh, Kate, at the beginning you said there were there were three bullets of what you had learned and one is the importance of communication. I wondered if you could elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah, so I think um, it's really interesting. Something Ripley told me was a lot of people come in as different majors and then default to communication. There's this kind of notion that communication isn't necessarily reputable reputable in the academic field, but this study was something- I didn't say that. Ripley didn't say that. Ripley didn't say that. That was not what he said. <laughs> but that was um, sort of kind of like the stigma you hear when you hear people talk about communications majors. But this study and just working with Ripley, it honestly was an, an uh, opportunity to see that like communication is complex and there's levels and there's methods that people have in doing this. And as we're taking methods class, the way that um, that is something that is super strategic. It's not something that is super frou-frou the way that I sometimes hear people think about communication. So it was a really amazing study to kind of understand the layers and the depth of communication as a discipline. I don't think she anticipated having to code XML documents in order to, um, you know, that was probably new and unexpected. Yeah. Other questions? Um, when interviewing participants from shelter, um, a lot of the guests, you know, are strangers at first, so they don't really have a social network at like the institution. Do you did any of them really mention ever kind of creating their own social networks based off of like gender or race or anything like that? So the I, you're right in that. Not many of them included people they met at the shelters as part of their social network. A few did. Um, I guess one of the, I just, frankly, this was a new population for me to interact with. I mean, this was like drinking from a fire hose in terms of understanding what people's experience is. And um, so that was, I mean, I, yeah, I would say one of the biggest things was that people tended to have a doggy dog mentality. And so there wasn't a lot of grouping within the shelter system. Um, there was a lot of theft, distrust, self-isolation, trying to remove yourself from your peers who were using substances to try and fight your own substance use battles. And so there wasn't a lot of people identifying connection with people in shelter systems. And I apologize, this was a movie this summer. Oh. We heard 62 really authentic stories and um, it just was a lot um, and so most of their community I mean most of them didn't have community at all um, and most of their community was really distant uh, so they weren't even local but there were some um, a few for instance one did uh, 
some of the shelters like Harbor Lights deployed by Salvation Army or um, St. Stephen's that really came through big for us and, and set up a lot of interviews for us. Um, they, they have ways of connecting that people can connect. And so one of them had a running group. And that was really nourishing for them was to have this running group. And they were all people who had experienced homelessness or were experiencing homelessness. And um, so things like that, that or the, the community, one, one person talked about, he's like, um, I, I've been here. I know what it's like. And I know what I can be for somebody else who's here, right? And so saw himself as just taking care of his brother or sister, you know, and reaching out. And um, so there were moments of community like that, that just like, it was just inspiring um, to hear the perseverance. I have the same experience working in the refugee community, um, communities, uh, the, I'm inspired by the perseverance and resilience and because people are rebuilding their lives, right? And that's just amazing to me. I was intrigued that three out of four refugee children sounded like you had on the onset. That was surprising. I wonder if you could comment on what you made of that. Yeah, so for, for one thing, St. Stephen's was specifically a shelter where a lot of couples came. They had a couple arrangements, and so they were somewhere we often went. But for the most part, it was interesting. Um, a lot of people did identify a significant other as kind of a safe person, and some marriages have lasted a significant amount of time. Um, and they weren't always marriages. Yeah. They were relationships. Other relationships. Yeah. 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 Um, but I think that was an artifact of conducting so many of our interviews at St. Stephen's that was specifically for, for couples. Um, one of the messages that came through, though, it was kind of a, a barrier, a pathway uh, at one, and that is that many of the women who had children and young children couldn't have their children in the shelter with them, or Child Protective Services had taken their children away, and that removed a source of inspiration or motivation for them when they couldn't be with their kids. And then there are very few shelters that, that allow mothers and their children to be there. Um, I have one student who's doing her internship with one of those shelters, and she's here. Um, and it's a new shelter and specifically creating spaces where mothers can be with their children. Because imagine, I mean, you're homeless and your children get taken away from you because you don't have a home. But that's part of your motivation to move on in life is caring for your kids. And so that system is set up against them in that way, uh, or it makes it difficult. So, so. speaking of children. <laughs> yeah, I was curious if you could elaborate more on the Envision community overall and like what the next steps look like moving forward with like the funding from Bethel and just, yeah, what that looks like for the community. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. go ahead. Um, so Envision, uh, they are, they're getting uh, private grant funding. So Bethel's not providing funding for Envision. But um, they do have, I think it was a million and a half dollar grant that they got. And that's going to allow them to build more units. Um, the, the unit that we do have was in the opening slide. Um, and again, I said that was in, it's, it's a unit that has, it's, it's, it's about the size of a cargo container, a shipping container. And then there's two units inside that space. Um, so they're, with that money, their first uh, task is to identify some property. And um, once they have that, they're going to start building more units. Um, the idea in, in behind Envision is to create a sustainable community that is about 20% people currently experiencing homelessness, but with low health, mental health uh, needs, um, about 60% of people who um, who have or are experiencing homelessness, um, and then about 20%, and those people, um, so you, I'm, I flipped it. Yeah, yeah. it's 60% that are have or are experiencing homelessness, but with low needs, mm -hmm. um, because the needs are significant from either mental health or addictive, um, you know, past or present. Um, I mean, it. And then 20% would be people experiencing homelessness with significant needs. Um, what I'm pitching, uh, where'd Robin go? She left. Um, what I'm pitching to Envision 
is the possibility of something like our social work house that we've had in the past. Um, and wouldn't it be, I don't know, would it be possible to have students some, as some of the participants in this community um, that could be part of the stability of that community? Uh, that, I don't know, it's just an idea that's going in my head. But that's really where they're at, is finding property and then building units. Um, and they've got some decisions to make in terms of management. How are they gonna manage it? The goal is to have it self-managed by the residents. Um, the residents get to decide that though. And some of the, some of the interview data, they said, no, we want security people there. Um, and other people said, no, the security people are the ones that are the problems in the other shelters. Um, and so I think they've got to navigate that a little bit too. But that's, um, it's, we are in partnership with Tasks Unlimited. Tasks is a, a nonprofit that um, provides mental health services and other services. And um, so they are our fiscal agent and managing, they'll be the managing partner. So that's about as much as I know right now. Anything else? We're almost done. Last questions? Thank you all for coming. Um, if you are interested in getting involved in, in this kind of work, uh, I would invite you to look into organizations like Street Voices of Change, Freedom from the Streets, um, or some of the shelters that are constantly looking for volunteer efforts and, and work. Um, there are lots of groups that spun up during the encampments, uh, and there are obviously more encampments during the summer and, and whatnot, but um, there are lots of people that are out there making a difference. So.